Right, welcome back to C-Real Simulation. This is CDT Lecture 4. We'll continue today with the spin interactions. We'll deal with EPR Hamiltonians today. But before I start with that, uh, I thought I'd give you a bit of a reminder about time-independent perturbation theory. This comes from a few questions that were asked at the last Q&A. Uh, it turns out that it wasn't perhaps covered in sufficient detail in your previous courses. So I thought I'd give you a one-page uh, tour of what time-independent perturbation theory is in quantum mechanics. Now, it happens to be the case quite often that we can solve with relative ease only the simplest quantum mechanical problems. With a little bit more effort, we can do something like the hydrogen atom analytically, but beyond that, uh, it's all numerics. And the numerics gets harder the more complicated the Hamiltonian is. So one of the popular approaches, uh, dating back to celestial mechanics, no less, is to solve the simple system and then treat all the complexity as a perturbation of that simple system. And there is a pretty beautiful theory that allows one to deal with it. So let's consider a simple system first. Let's um, say that it's called a Hamiltonian, H0, and that we've solved the eigenvalue and eigenfunction problem for it, in that we've got all the energy levels, psi n, of that system, which give us the energies, En, and the same wave function, psi n. So yeah, these are the eigenfunctions, the energies are the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, and that we have. Now, let us consider now a perturbation h1, which would be in some sense smaller than h0, so it only perturbs the system. Uh, what sense that is, we'll see when we derive uh, the resulting expressions, the corresponding series has to converge, so the norm of this, strictly speaking, has to be much smaller than the norm of that. But okay, it perturbs our system. And so we would like to find both the new eigenfunctions and the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, which would be the sum of H0 and H1. Uh, more precisely, because we'll be taking advantage of Taylor series in um, the derivation, we'll do the following. We'll have the new Hamiltonian to be equal to H1, H0 plus lambda H1, where lambda is a variable that controls, as it were, the amplitude of this H1. And if lambda is 0, then there's no perturbation. And if lambda equals to 1, then the perturbation is fully switched on. And so let's try obtaining at least some approximate expressions for the size and the ease. What we'll do is we'll call these the zeros approximation. And we will state, uh, and that is true for any function that is sufficiently well behaved, uh, and certainly wave functions being physical objects are infinitely differentiable and so on and so forth, We'll state that the new functions, the new energy levels, psi n, of the perturbed system would have an expansion, a Taylor expansion, uh, in terms of these original functions uh, as a function of this parameter. So what we'll say is that it will be psi zero's approximation n plus lambda times the first order correction to that level psi 1 plus lambda squared is a second order correction, psi 2 plus so on. And similarly for the energies, we will state that E of the nth level of the perturbed system would be the nth level of the original system plus lambda times the first order correction plus lambda squared times the second order correction to the level n and so on. And we, of course, require that the new Schrodinger equation with respect to the new Hamiltonian is still obeyed. And therefore, what we have to have is that H0 plus lambda H1 acting on the new function, so psi n0 plus lambda psi 1 n plus lambda squared psi 2n and so on must return 
the new energies, so En, zero, plus lambda En one, plus lambda squared En two, and so on, times z same function. Psi n zero plus lambda psi n one plus lambda squared psi n two and so on. Now a Taylor expansion of a function is unique. That is what will happen because lambda is a variable is the terms corresponding to different powers of lambda must be equal on either side of the expression. And so if we open up these brackets and then equate the coefficients in front of each power of lambda, what we will find is the following system of relations. The first one for power 0 will be the same as this. We already know that, so h not acting on our zeros approximation, that is the unperturbed function would return us the unperturbed energy of that level, psi n zero and the original function. But the second uh, and uh, the first and second powers here are more interesting because they provide us with the corrections, the perturbative corrections to our wave function and to the energy levels. And so what we've got in there once we do that equating is H naught psi n first correction plus h1 acting on psi and zeros correction must be equal to e and zeros correction psi n first plus e and first correction psi n zeros. This all looks like a huge amount of algebra, but it's a, it's a fairly straightforward algebra. Uh, and the other term that we will require is when we equate the squares of the right-hand side and the left-hand side. And so what we will have in there is h naught acting on psi and second correction, which we will not actually require, we'll, uh, as it will turn out in a moment, only needs the first correction to wave function to get the second correction to energy, plus h1 acting on first correction must be equal to E n not acting on psi second correction plus E 1 n acting on psi first correction plus E 2 n acting on the unperturbed wave function. Zero n. There we are. So this we know. Uh, these are interesting because we require the first correction to the energy and the second correction to the energy in terms of hopefully the matrix elements of the perturbation. And as you saw in the previous lecture, it is these uh, that we then plugged into the expressions for the various magnetic properties. For example, the chemical shielding tensor, delta, was delta IJ was the second derivative of the total energy to second order with respect to the magnetic moment of the nucleus and to the applied magnetic field, their components. So once we've put in the magnetic field like that, we can actually then differentiate it and obtain these things. In practice, this will be done for you by the quantum chemistry software, but it is essential that we understand what's going on inside those moments. Okay, so let's try pulling out the first order correction to the energy out of the equation. One thing that we can do to it is to multiply it on this side, on the left, by the unperturbed wave function, psi n zero. And let's see what happens when we do that. So I'll make some space um, of maybe a wound. Well, let's just write it out. Psi n zero acting on H naught psi n one plus psi n zero acting on H one 
my n zero, and that b equal to the right hand side, side not n acting on e n zero, psi n one plus psi not n e n one acting on psi. Let's take a look at what we've got. Psi n0 is an eigenfunction of h0, and so by acting with it on the left, we can simply replace it by the energy. Yeah? E0 m. Then this is just a number, and this is just a number, but note that this number cancels this number because the two terms are exactly the same. Uh, and that the original unperturbed wave functions from the original problem are orthonormal. And so once we take this number out, this integral is actually equal to 1. And so ultimately we actually get the expression for the first order correction. E1n is psi 0n h1 psi 0. And if you look at the expressions for, for example, the chemical shielding tensor that we have um, been looking at in the previous lecture, you will find uh, this term in there, and it's called the diamagnetic term. In there. To obtain the paramagnetic term, we need to consider the second equation here. Uh, and, um, well, let's see what falls out of it. So H1 in our context would be all those extra terms that come out of modifying the momentum part uh, of the Hamiltonian to include the magnetic vector potential. For very complicated interactions, as we'll see in a moment, G-tensor in particular, there can be quite a few terms in those derivatives. Uh, but I guess for our purposes, we just say that the derivatives are computed by the computer and we only use, in spin dynamics context, certainly, the resulting interaction matrix. And we only need to understand where uh, it has come from. Right, so let's deal with the second equation. After we do the same to it, after we multiply it on one side by the unperturbed wave function, rearrange the terms, uh, I'm skipping a considerable amount of mathematics in here, what we'll find is that the second correction for our n's energy level is the following. It will be psi and zeros correction integral with the perturbation h1 psi and first correction minus e n first correction and the integral psi and zero with psi and one. You see, in order to compute this second energy, what we require is the first correction to the wave function. Now, because this is a spin dynamics course, not a molecular quantum mechanics course, I will skip the fairly lengthy derivation which goes along fairly similar lines to this, and I'll simply write down the expression for that first correction wave function, the particulars you can find in the textbooks. So the first correction psi n1, after a huge amount of mathematics, ends up being equal to the sum over k that's not equal to n, psi 0 n, or in this case k, h1 psi 0 n, divided by the energy difference in the unperturbed system, e n minus e 0 k, times psi k zero. After we plug this into here and do the various simplifications, uh, the result um, then for the total energy, so I put the first order and the second order correction in, is the following. Uh, En is En of the unperturbed system plus the first order correction psi n zero h1 psi n0 plus the second order correction coming out of this expression as sum over k that's not equal to n 
psi 0 and h1 psi 0 k and psi 0 k h1 psi 0 divided by the energy difference e 0 and minus e 0 k okay so bottom line this is those extra terms that came out of the introduction of the magnetic field and this is the correction to the energy of each level if we're looking at the ground state and would be equal to zero uh, two second order in time independent perturbation theory and because magnetic interactions are quite weak this is generally sufficient for most purposes unless you have some terribly strong perturbations like in polymetallic cluster spinoid coupling can sometimes be so significant as to render these expressions invalid but that's a, a fairly rare situation so in the vast majority of cases that would be how a quantum chemistry program does those energy corrections and then after we differentiate this with respect to the various magnetic moments and the magnetic fields um, some terms survive in these expressions others get cancelled uh, and uh, this is what we will be looking at for the rest of the lecture okay so uh, moving on and continuing with our survey of spin interactions the next one on the plate is the g tensor that is the term in the spin hamiltonian that describes the interaction of the electronic spin uh, with the applied magnetic uh, in the context of spin dynamics, the Hamiltonian is really simple. Uh, Hg uh, is the Bohr magneton. Its presence is historically could have been packaged up into the interaction matrix, but uh, this is how history um, made it look. Uh, the vector of spin operators for the electron, yeah, Lx, Ly, Lz, times the G matrix, uh, or the G tensor, times the applied magnetic field. And well, if the field is only applied on Z, then this is going to be 0, 0, B naught in a typical mechanism. Okay, so this is the energy operator, and if we put wave functions around here, that would give us the energy. Uh, and therefore, the G tensor matrix would be the second derivative of the energy with respect to the electromagnetic moment and with respect to the applied magnetic field. In other words, what we are looking at is G and K would be d to e by d magnetic moment of the electron m d b k. Uh, what is um, specific about uh, G tensor is that it actually has a component that is um, doesn't depend on the details of the electronic structure series, the so-called G factor. So the G tensor is actually a sum of a G factor, uh, GE, which is about uh, equal to 2, as most of you probably know, times the unit matrix plus delta G. And delta G is this correction that comes out as a result of the electronic structure theory being there, whereas GE refers to the free um, electron. So what we are specifically dealing with now is the correction due to there being some electronic structure and some energy levels to perturb and so on and so forth. So, once we take this derivative, and again, I'm skipping a significant amount of quantum chemistry uh, in here. This really isn't the topic of the spin dynamics course. There are several classes of terms that survive in the resulting expressions. Uh, there's the diamagnetic part, uh, as we also saw in the case of the chemical shielding for the nuclei. There's the paramagnetic part, uh, the diamagnetic part is dominated by the fairly simple term, the interaction between the vector potentials coming from the external field and the dipole of the electron. Uh, but the paramagnetic term includes the spin orbit coupling. Uh, and this is why in systems with large spin orbit couplings, such as metal systems, uh, it is um, fairly frequent, frequently the case that G tensors are either highly anisotropic or deviate very significantly from uh, the values of, of the free electron. So delta G, uh, and again this expression will be computed for you by the quantum chemistry package, is the ground state psi 0 times H D S 
tell you in a moment what that is. H R C, and that is the diamagnetic term plus the paramagnetic term, or rather minus, a half. A sum, as we saw in the case of perturbation theory, over all the excited states. So m from 1 to infinity, that's usually infinity many of those. Uh, and then psi 0, h spin orbit, psi m, psi m, l, g, psi 0, plus raise complex conjugate of the term, psi 0, l, g, psi m, so m, h, s, o, psi 0. So you can recognize that second order perturbation theory expression that we just derived, yeah, but for the ground state, because we would like to have the G tensor in the ground state. Now, as for the various terms, you can find them in the specialized literature. They are, I guess at our level, just a meaningless um, mass of mathematical notation, but I will only describe the physical meaning of each. Uh, the DS is something that's called diamagnetic shielding term, and that comes out of the A times A, yeah, the quadratic part of that correction that we had in the momentum term, where this is the external, uh, and that's uh, the electron typo. Uh, so that goes into there. The relativistic Zeeman term is the correction to Zeeman interaction due to the relativistic effects. Uh, in heavy systems in particular, uh, but it actually has the same power in 1 over the speed of light as the rest of the equation, so it really needs to be here, even in systems that are not manifestly relativistic. The spin orbit term is the coupling between the magnetic moment that's created by the orbital motion of the electrons, so it's also a circular current and therefore a magnetic moment, uh, and it's a coupling to the spin of the electron, but also to the spins of the surrounding nuclei. So uh, it's, a, it's a fairly complicated term. It includes a, a large number of, of various contributions. Uh, and then Lg is simply the orbital momentum of the electron relative to the gauge origin. Um, and well, once these integrals are taken, uh, the G tensor falls out. And for our purposes, it is just a 3 by 3 matrix. The next one on the list uh, is the hyperfine interaction. And that one comes in two components. So consider a molecule uh, with some electronic structure distribution uh, and a few nuclei. The part of the um, electronic structure that is relevant for us is the so-called spin density. That is the difference between electron spin-up density and electron spin-down density at a particular point in space, because this is what determines the magnetic moment in there. And so there are two components of magnetic interactions between this electron spin density and the nucleus. There is the spin density at the actual point of the nucleus. Now, curiously, quantum mechanically, if you look at the nuclear structure and peak inside the nucleus, uh, it contains those nucleons interacting with one another, uh, but electrons can actually penetrate inside the nucleus. And uh, the interaction that results, uh, the mathematical origin of it is fairly complicated, I wouldn't um, derive the thing from scratch, but the name of it um, sort of suggests itself, it's called the contact interaction. Uh, this is the interaction that depends on the density of the, uh, of the electron spin at the specific point of the nucleus. Uh, but there's also, of course, uh, the distance interaction with various other points in the electron density, and that would just be the magnetic dipolar interaction um, of the types that we already encountered uh, for the internuclear one, except this one is going to be between the electron and the nucleus, but the principle remains the same. So, okay, the contact interaction, uh, described in huge detail by Enrico Fermi, hence the Fermi contact name, HFC, Fermi contact interaction, is a bunch of fundamental constants, uh, 8 pi h bar divided by 3, uh, magnetogenic ratio of the electron, because it determines the electron magnetic moment, times the magnetogenic ratio of the nucleus, uh, it has to 
directly proportional to it as the interaction strength times, as expected, the spin density at the nucleus point times the term that looks reminiscent of the J coupling in that it's actually isotropic. Uh, S electron, S nuclei, scalar product. So yeah, this is a shorthand for Sx, Sx plus Sy, Sy plus Sz, Sz. Uh, so really looks quite similar to the J coupling. And it's also rotationally invariant. Uh, and so we can say that the Fermi contact term of the hyperfine interaction is responsible for its isotropic part. And it also does not get averaged uh, in non-viscous liquids as an isotropic interactions would have been, at least partially. For our purposes, once the quantum chemistry software has evaluated um, the uh, spin density, or in fact we could have measured the same property from an EPR spectrum, uh, the Hamiltonian will just look like that. So the LX, SX, plus LY, SY, plus LZ, SZ where L refers to the electron and S to the nucleus, and A is just a number known in the trade as the isotropic hyperfine coupling constant. Now, there's a little bit of um, history here. Again, uh, this coupling constant in ordinary quantum mechanical context would, of course, be measured in angular frequencies as standard quantum mechanical units of energy. But it just so happens that historically uh, it's reported in the literature in units of magnetic field, uh, which is slightly unexpected because it doesn't have a dimension of the magnetic field, it has a dimension of energy. But you'll often find these constants either in units of Gauss uh, or in units of midi Tesla. And that's historical, and that um, notation is the field at which the free electron would have had the frequency that's equal to the frequency corresponding to this hyperfine interaction. Um, quite a mouthful, but it thankfully translates to just one simple number, uh, which I gave to you in the handout. So a hyperfine coupling of one Gauss, um, or equivalently of 0.1 millitesla, uh, corresponds to 2.803 megahertz uh, or to 17.609 times 10 to the 6 uh, in angular frequency units. So this can be obtained from this by just multiplying it by the magnetogenic ratio of the free electron. Um, history is history, unfortunately, and um, even ourselves, uh, we do tend to report the, the hyperfine coupling in Gauss. Uh, as soon as, well, once SI came on the scene, the standard unit of magnetic field in SI is, of course, Tesla. And some people insist on mini Tesla, but um, I, for one, am just old fashioned and I usually report my hyperfine coupling in Gauss. But of course, when it goes into a simulation, it has to be 2 pi times 2.803 megahertz times whatever value in Gauss that it actually has. So that's the isotropic hyperfine interaction, and that, as I said, is coming from the actual contact. Uh, although, um, physically speaking, if you look through the derivation, it's not quite that okay, but uh, <laughs> let's put it that way for the uh, purposes of the introduction. Uh, the, the brave can look into Fermi's actual papers and uh, see uh, the gory detail of where this thing is coming from. Uh, but anyway, uh, the second contribution to this is just the dipolar coupling. And uh, you remember in the case of a nucleus-nucleus interaction, what we simply had is, is that polar matrix, and I'll remind you what that was, HDD uh, was minus mu naught over 4 pi, uh, then H bar, then the magnetogenic ratio of the electron, the magnetogenic ratio of the nucleus, and if the electron were the point object, yeah, like the nucleus is, uh, then we would have had just the standard dipolar interaction in there which I derived in the previous lecture. So we've got, uh, I'm just leaving the space here for something, three times the spin of the electron times the distance vector between the electron and the nucleus. To make some more space in here. Uh, times the uh, reverse of that, EN times S, S 
and that is here uh, divided by r e n to the fifth. It's actually q, but you've got the square in the numerator, and so it doesn't logically, of course, behave as one over r q uh, minus s e s n scalar product to ensure that the thing is traceless e n q. Then uh, this was the, as it were, the internuclear case, but now what we say is because the electron is a distributed object, what we need to do is we need to integrate the result over the distribution of the probability density of the electron spin, which is simply the electron spin density of the molecule. And so what is here is in fact an integral. This is multiplied by that electron density, the infinitesimal value for the probability of the electron being at that infinitesimal point, and then we integrate over the volume which is occupied by the electron spin density. Now, this has uh, one significant consequence. If you remember the previous lecture, I told you that the inter-nuclear dipolar interaction, um, this one, uh, without the integral was traceless and axial. Yeah, the trace was zero and the axiality uh, and the remissity was zero. Now, in the case of the electron, the trace is still zero because however many traceless matrices you sum up or integrate over, the result is still traceless. However, rhombicity is no longer zero. Uh, the result for that is if we have one axial tensor and then another axial tensor, and then another axial tensor, and we add them together, the rhombicity of the result didn't necessarily be zero, even though the original component had a zero rhombicity. So the difference between the electron nuclear and internuclear dipolar coupling is potentially non-zero rhombicity. And because it contributes to the same sort of Hamiltonian with the electron on one side and the nucleus on the other, with a matrix in the middle in this case, uh, it is the other component of the hyperfine interaction known in the trade as the anisotropic part of the hyperfine interaction. Now, in practical calculations with electronic structure theory methods, such as Gaussian, there is an interesting caveat to watch out for. Imagine a molecule that we've got and we would like to have this hyperfine interaction computed and there is some electron density around it. You may remember from your quantum mechanics that a nucleus, a point nucleus at least, for the purposes of a quantum chemistry calculation represents a singularity. And that generates a discontinuity in the derivative of the density. So in other words, the density has a cusp at the nucleus a sharp corner. A Gaussian, however, which goes into the basis set for that calculation has a smooth top. That's an approximation, of course, but in order to reproduce this cusp, you need quite a few Gaussians. In particular, you need very sharp Gaussians, so that the linear combination doesn't do it properly. The result is that the isotropic hyperfine coupling constants are, unless you take special measures, actually rather different to, to difficult to calculate with quantum chemistry techniques. However, the anisotropic part is a broad integral over the totality, the overall distribution of the electron spin density, which most methods, even the crudest methods, like, like hartree fock on a small basis, broadly get correct. And so it turns out that if you are computing or are interested in just the anisotropic part, you can get away with pretty simple calculations. Yeah, DFT with something standard like this really will do the job. However, if you're interested in computing the isotropic part, then you have to take special measures and introduce the tight Gaussians in the basis and so on. So the bottom line here is, um, after a considerable amount of effort uh, by several people in the area, particularly Vincenzo Barone, uh, the method of choice that you would want to use for a CHNO radical if you are computing hyperfine uh, coupling tensors in there uh, is B3 lip EPR2 where this is the basis and that's the exchange correlation function for the DFT that was specifically optimized for CHNO radicals 
If it's a heavy radical, then, then things get difficult to uh, look in the literature, but for light radicals, this will generally work. Okay, moving on. Uh, the dipolar interactions exist not just between nuclei, nuclei, electron and nuclei, but also in between the electrons. Now, there are two parts to that story as well. If the electrons are well separated, let's say by 15 or 20 angstroms, then we can do just the extension of what I just did, except we'd have to integrate all of the distributions of two electrons as well. Difficulties start, however, if the electrons overlap. And then all the denominators in those integrals um, develop singularities and things become difficult and the electrons can no longer even be treated as separate particles. Uh, and so in the case of them being well separated, uh, we call the interaction the inter-electron dipolar coupling. And in the case where the electrons do overlap and we have to go into the total momentum representation, the thing is known in the trade as the zero field splitting. But uh, we'll get to that in, um, at the end of the lecture. Let's take a look at the interaction which is happening between two well separated electrons. So let's say we've got an electron here and an electron here, corresponding, say, to a situation where you have two spin labels in a protein uh, at a considerable distance, and so you don't need to worry about the overlap of uh, the corresponding clouds. Well, uh, as um, we can just um, generalize out of what was previously on the board, mu not over 4 pi, h bar gamma e squared, if they are, if their g tensors differ significantly, then it will have to be gamma e1, gamma e2, um, Double integral over the same huge dipole dipole matrix times the density of the first electron times the density of the second electron, d volume of the first electron, d volume of the second electron. Six dimensional integral, uh, but uh, nothing too complicated. In fact, if the two electrons are separated by a very large distance, say 20 angstroms or so, they can even be treated as point particles. Uh, and so you no longer need to integrate over the distribution, you can just use the point dipolar interaction, uh, which is used a lot, for example, in, in deer and pelvic spectroscopy. People very rarely actually go to the trouble of computing this integral. They just treat electrons as point particles because the distance is sufficient for that to be a good approximation. Right. The next inter-electron interaction is uh, exchange, and it has um, a curious origin. Um, I guess, in a sense, uh, um, not similar, but uh, vaguely echoing the origin of the nuclear quadrupolar interaction, which wasn't a spin interaction at all, it was electrostatic. It just happened to indirectly involve spin, and so it did manifest itself in the spin Hamiltonian. Exchange is similar in a sense that it is also fundamentally an electrostatic interaction. It's just in quantum mechanics, as we'll see in a moment, the anti-symmetry principle just makes it depend on spin. And so what was something electrostatic, because it indirectly involves spin, ends up being present in the spin Hamiltonian. And exactly how that happens, I will show you in a moment. Right. So consider two electrons and consider a simple Coulomb interaction between them. So if we have an electron um, with a wave function phi 1 uh, of x or r, um, whatever is the spatial variable, uh, and then another electron with wave function phi 2, uh, you know that because electrons are fundamentally uh, identical, what we must do is anti-symmetrize any total wave function with respect to the label permutation. The two electrons would have states, uh, they could be in alpha or beta, and alpha or beta here, and the total wave function would be the product of the spatial part and the spin part, and by the Pauli exclusion principle it needs to be anti-symmetric as a whole, with respect to particle label permutations. And so after we do that anti-symmetrization, uh, what we get is the following. Uh, 
uh, 1 over root 2 by 1 of x1 by 2 of x2 plus phi 2 of x1 phi 1 of x2. And as you see, this is symmetric. If we permute the labels, uh, the two terms get swapped around because there's a plus here, there's no overall sign change. And therefore, in order for the total wave function to be anti-symmetric, the spin part has to be anti-symmetric. And so we would put alpha beta minus beta alpha over root 2 here for the spin part. This, as many of you know, is called a single state. Something that is anti-symmetric with respect to the particle permutation. Right, so this is one of the four possible functions. The second situation would come about if we decide for our space to be anti-symmetric. And so in the case where we've got the spatial wave function with a minus, so phi 1 of x1, phi 2 of x2, minus phi 2 of x1, phi 1 of x2, we would require the spin path this time to be symmetric, because if it were anti-symmetric, the total thing would have been symmetric in violation of the exclusion principle. And it turns out that there are three spin functions which are symmetric, alpha, alpha, beta, beta, and also alpha, beta plus beta, alpha over root two, the three components of the triplet. And so what we've got is the three functions of this kind uh, and one function of that kind. And now let's take a look at the corresponding Coulomb interactions. So, in order to get a Coulomb interaction, we just need this one over for the psi, yep, the expectation value of the Coulomb energy operator, that one over four pi epsilon naught term is one in atomic unit, so we just have one over r. Uh, spin doesn't enter, it's a pure integral over space, uh, but of course, uh, the wave functions have to overlap correctly in this case. So, the densities of this and this, uh, the electron densities in the space are exactly the same, uh, but the spin states are different. And now let's take a look at the corresponding Coulomb energy. There's quite a lot of uh, writing in that case, but I think it's useful, so I'll just do that writing explicitly on the board. It's given in the handout for you to go through uh, in detail if you want to, but it turns out that because of this anti-symmetrization that we've just done, the energy of the Coulomb interaction starts to depend on spin. So, if we do the singlet 1 over r singlet, it's written out uh, in the handout for you. The first integral in equation 16 I will call k, and the second integral I will call j, uh, the expressions are just given in there. But if we look at the triplet, 1 over r triplet, then it will be k minus j. Yep. The second integral, the so-called exchange integral, changes sign. And so it turns out that even though the spatial distributions are the same, the energies of the interaction do in fact depend on just the spin state of the two electrons. So, if we, really, if we need to build the corresponding spin Hamiltonian now that will only depend on spin, uh, what we simply need to state is for its matrix elements, T0, H, T0 is the same as T plus minus, the alpha, alpha, and beta, beta, H, T plus minus is minus J, and then singlet, H, singlet is plus J. So what kind of spin Hamiltonian would have the corresponding eigenvalues? Well, you all know that if we know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix, we can reconstruct the original matrix. Um, it's this, so it's sum over um, m, a, m, m. That's equal to the matrix if m are the eigenvectors and a are the eigenvalues. So we'll do the same for the Hamiltonian. And so H exchange uh, will be equal to J, then alpha, beta, minus beta, alpha projectile, 
divided by 2, uh, and then minus j, uh, triplet, triplet, alpha, 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 minus j, beta, 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 and minus j, alpha, beta, plus, beta, alpha, alpha, beta, plus, beta, alpha, all one, two. Writing that out explicitly in the matrix form, what we'll get to is the following. Alpha, 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 beta, beta, alpha, and beta, beta. Then the matrix in the middle will have minus j, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 j, 0, 0, j, 0, 0, and finally minus j in here, and three zeros. Okay, and then the column alpha, 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 beta, beta, alpha, and beta, beta. Well, let's take a bit of a closer look at this. I told you in the previous lectures that spin interactions are traceless because the trace of uh, the spin Hamiltonian are traceless because the trace of the Hamiltonian is just corresponding to a uniform um, lifting up or down of uh, the total energy of the system, which doesn't affect the dynamics. So why don't we subtract the trace out of this matrix uh, and take a look at what the result would be. In your equation 22, you can see that the result is minus j over 2, uh, j over 2, j over 2, minus j over 2, that's the diagonal, and then j, j on the off diagonal, and the rest are zeros. And if we plot the matrix for simple scalar coupling, either a J coupling in NMR or isotropic hyperfine coupling in EPR, what we will find is that in fact the corresponding matrix, so um, Lx Sx plus Ly Sy plus Lz Sz, is equal to something very similar. 1 over 4 minus 1 over 4 minus 1 over 4, 1 over 4, and then a half, a half. So if we simply just multiply out the corresponding Pauli matrices for this expression, that is what we are going to get. And you can see the obvious similarity here, yeah? that this is this times minus 2j. And so this pins down the spin Hamiltonian for the exchange interaction. And in this case, actually, I have taken you through the complete theory. Yeah, I didn't skip anything, didn't relegate anything to a quantum chemistry package. Uh, this is uh, how the exchange coupling comes to be. And so because of this, and because of the fact that we eventually recover the isotropic coupling in this case, J coupling uh, between the electrons, the exchange coupling manifests itself as just the isotropic coupling which can be huge. It just happens to depend exponentially on distance uh, the details depend on the electronic structure of the molecule, but it can go into megahertz and gigahertz, and in some systems can actually completely dominate the dynamics. In particular, it is the exchange coupling between the electrons that actually makes the chemical bond possible. Um, so it is uh, quite important and can be fairly large if the two electrons are spaced closely together. But anyway, the final expression for the exchange coupling in spin dynamics is minus 2j, where j comes out of experiment, lx sx plus ly sy plus lz sz, where the two spin operators refer to the two electrons. Now, as you can see, it is um, falling into that isotropic interaction class, uh, and it is often hard to take um, to distinguish between this exchange interaction and the effects that it has uh, and um, the two electron dipolar interaction uh, component that is due to zero field splitting because that also has an isotropic component and ZFS is something that we will deal with last it's quite um, exotic uh, it is never present, just like quadrupolar interaction isn't present for systems with spin half. 
So zero field splitting doesn't exist for a single unpaired electron with spin half. But if you have either multiple unpaired electrons or you have an unpaired electron with a higher spin, spin one, spin three half, and so on, then it would manifest. ZFS is a quadratic interaction, uh, so it has a mathematical term similar to the quadrupole coupling. It's in fact the electron analog of the quadrupole coupling. It's written down like this, where this is the vector of the electron spin operators, referring in this case to the same electron. And this again is just a three by three matrix. The origins of this are very complicated indeed. Uh, this is a topic of ongoing current research, so I won't go into that. What I'll simply state is it is computed in the same way as everything else is computed. Yeah? It is the D is the second derivative of the total energy with respect to the electron magnetic moment. And so D i j is d to e by d mu i d mu j, where mu is the electromagnetic moment. Uh, and E is calculated using the perturbation theory as that uh, I've introduced at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, and this really is really, really hard, particularly in relativistic systems. Uh, and it turned out rather recently that a DFT in most cases wouldn't even come close. So configuration interaction needs to be done in the electronic structure theory level. So it's a fairly nightmarish interaction, which I think uh, you can only measure these days. Uh, computing it is rather hard. Okay, the final topic for the lecture is um, visualization of this. Now, having a matrix uh, is all fine, except a uh, human brain isn't really adapted to working with uh, large tables of numbers. And so what people commonly do in order to get uh, a sense of the directional dependence of these things uh, is to uh, do a schematic plot of them. And the schematic plot, uh, in a way, touches on those ellipsoids that I've uh, shown you when I was introducing the shielding in the previous lecture. So, assuming we have a matrix A, yeah, it's a 3 by 3 matrix, and it has three eigenvalues, it has a x x, a y y, and a z z, and it has the three corresponding eigenvectors, yeah, the x, the y, and the z. Most matrices are symmetric uh, that we would encounter, and so x is perpendicular to the y and perpendicular to the z, and these are the magnitudes of the interaction in the three corresponding directions. So the way it's visualized is we draw a molecule, something, then at the nucleus of interest, um, let's say that would be this nucleus here, we draw a sphere. Inside the sphere, we draw the eigenvectors, so the three axes, say, that. And then we scale the sphere by AXX in the x direction, by AYY in the y direction, and by AZZ in the z direction. So the result would look like this. It would be an ellipsoid. This the axis drawn inside. Uh, and the dimensions of that ellipsoid would be indicative of the three eigenvectors, uh, eigenvalues, and the direction of uh, the axis of the ellipsoid would be the direction of the corresponding eigenvectors. So the result is known as an ellipsoid plot. Uh, the axes are usually colored. If this is positive, then the axis is red. If it's negative, then the axis is blue. Uh, the only software package uh, that can actually visualize such things out of the box at the moment is spinach. Uh, it can just simply read your Gaussian log and display those interactions. There are a few examples in the example set, so take a look. Uh, so that is, uh, in a way, a convention number one. Convention number two, which is slightly harder to understand, but um, is to an extent more natural because it's more mathematically mm, rigorous, is using the so-called spherical harmonic laws. 
I will get to that in a lecture or two, but I have already introduced uh, a couple of lectures ago those um, irreducible spherical parameters for the interaction interactions uh, we had rank 0 and rank 2 uh, interactions, which this was describing the isotropic part and this was describing the anisotropy. Uh, I gave it without derivation because derivation comes after we get the rotation group theory. But basically, the story goes is you take A, you translate it into the irreducible spherical tensor coefficients, and you use them as coefficients in front of a spherical harmonic. And then you plot the linear combination of those spherical harmonics, and the result is what would have happened if we were to treat the signs in here um, strictly. So imagine that AYY is negative. Uh, and so in the corresponding direction, we would have needed to actually pull the ellipsoid inside out. Uh, the result would have looked something like this. So there would be a lobe like that, and then a lobe like this. Uh, and those of you who did uh, orbitals would recognize as a D-type orbital. Uh, and so, in the case of a spherical harmonic plot, the negative eigenvalues actually are twisting the ellipsoid inside out. Uh, whether to choose this or that is largely a matter of taste. Uh, these plots tend to be a bit more cluttered and a bit harder to understand. Uh, these plots are a little bit neater. If you look in the literature, uh, you'll find in the very early literature the ellipsoid plots. Then the middle, um, sort of 1980s to 1990s, the spherical tensor plots. But in the recent literature, it's gone back to the ellipsoid plots. So really up to you. Um, ultimately, mathematically speaking, very strictly, uh, these interactions, the spin interactions, are operating in a spin space anyway, which is distinct from the physical space. And so the details of the Cartesian representation are, are perhaps a matter of taste, uh, but, well, um, there goes, uh, try both and uh, see which one works for you. Okay, uh, that's the end of this lecture, and uh, I'll see you next Monday.